Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. In this video, I'm going to be talking all about methane. Methane is a very potent greenhouse gas and it's rapidly building up in the atmosphere. There's many, many sources on the planet of methane and we seem to be getting more and more methane from those sources, both anthropogenic and uh, also, so human uh, sources, but also sources from the um, Earth uh, climate system. So I'll talk about the spatial distribution of methane on the planet uh, by looking, by taking you to various uh, websites with real-time data. I'll talk about the global warming potential of methane relative to CO2. I'll talk about the the trends of the increase of concentration of methane in the atmosphere. And I'll also discuss the necessity in the near term of actually finding ways to remove uh, methane from the atmosphere. And there's some interesting ideas to do that. And uh, I've got Shackleton on my lap right now. He's kind of, uh, kind of, uh, making some noises and stuff maybe he wants to get down soon uh, but he might make some appearances in this video so this is a video that is all about methane so the first thing that i showed you before i started talking was the uh something called a pulse uh map uh pulse uh, by ghg sat map so what you see there is you see the uh, scale is up on the upper left. Okay, get my pointer here. So this is the methane concentration up here. So anything red on this map is over 1900 parts per billion of methane. Okay, and I'll come back to this uh, I'll come back to this map uh, shortly. If you if you follow on Facebook and other social media, there's a lot being posted of these type of maps here. This is a CAMS map, and I'll show you uh, what information we can get from it. But it's CAMS is Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service. This is some data from uh, just uh, yesterday, actually. Um, and Peter Carter put together this slide for the Climate Emergency Institute. And you'll recall that Peter and I um, and others gave many presentations at the recent uh, climate conference um, in uh, Glasgow, Scotland, that just uh, finished uh, towards the end of last year. So what Peter says is that China's recently ordered coal mines to maximize production. NASA's detected methane plumes from China coal mines, okay, China coal mining, um, also from India coal and uh, Pakistan and India, a very large landfills. And what you can see is these, there's many hot spots on the planet. <clears throat> Most of them in the Northern Hemisphere. There's a few in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, but I'll, I'll go into the details of some of these, these maps. Um, also, interestingly, is there's these dashed lines on these other maps, um, which are showing pipelines. And this is an expanded view of North American. So the pipelines are illustrated and you can see where the methane emissions are so these would be natural gas pipelines and oil pipelines and things um, this is a map of methane emissions from oil gas and coal exploration um, and you can see where the concentrated uh, sources of emission from methane <coughs> are excuse me okay so there's lots of graphs like that uh, appearing on social media so what are we to make of all of that? So basically, um, late last year, 
the Arctic report card came out. It came out in early December of, of 2021 when the American Meteorological Society um, was, or, or the American Geophysical Union, AGU, was meeting. Uh, the American Meteorological Society is having a meeting actually ongoing this week. So it was the AGU, they re released the Arctic report card. Interestingly enough, um, they didn't really, you know, they have a whole bunch of dis different sessions, and I should probably go over this in detail in another video, but there was, a, there was no separate section on methane. Um, the only methane, they talked about glacier and permafrost hazards. I thought methane would be in this section, but it's mostly the effects of, on people and infrastructure of, uh, you know, when you get permafrost slumps and sagging in the permafrost. So again, you know, it was basically very, very little next to nothing on methane. So, you know, they, they don't, uh, I, there should always be sections. You can't should, can't talk about the Arctic without talking about about methane. So if I go to this site ghgsat.com, um, this is an interesting global satellite emissions monitoring and intelligence site, and this is a actually one of the sensors uh, to measure the um, to, to detect methane. Um, in the atmosphere below the uh, satellite. And uh, I'm going to show you, so that this is the data um, on the methane concentrations from this uh, satellite. Now, what you can see is, so you can pull up and there's, you know, along the outskirts of Greenland, there's emissions. This is emissions from January 15, 2022. So very uh, recent <laughs> very recent emissions, um, up-to-date emissions. And you can see um, by changing the scale, you can see most of it is in the, you know, this band of heavy industry across North America and Europe and Asia, down to, you know, India, parts of Africa, you, high methane emissions, very, very little in the Southern hemisphere. Okay, so that's one of the key points. And, uh, you know, you can really zoom in and get, uh, you know, very detailed information about specific regions. Okay, so, you know, a lot in heavily industrialized regions full of methane up here, lots of methane, but very little industry. So, you know, the sources need to be looked at. Um, okay, so anyway, this is a good resource. And... What we can do is just, uh, you know, play, play the, uh, play a movie of it. Okay, so this is April 11th, 2020, and it's cycling through and showing you the methane. So I won't, uh, you know, go to this website and play around with it. But the end date here is just, um, like I said, January 15th. So just a week and a half ago, 2022, and if you compare this image to, uh, to uh, this is February 2021, this is January 23rd, 2021. So compare this image. So look at, there is, you can see methane coming out of the different regions, but the methane in 2022 is way, way, um, there, there's a lot more coming out the the emission is way way higher in january this year as opposed to january last year you know and we can look at uh you know april of 2020 and see the emissions are are extremely low okay that that's the first thing okay um now this site um this uh there's a methane collaboratory site here uh ch4 collaboratory and there's lots of um, information and data put here on methane, but there's many partners that are industrial partners, oil companies, et cetera, um, that are, you know, running, running this site. But there is some interesting methane information on this. So I'm just drawing your attention to it. Now on social media lately, you'll see all kinds of people 
posting. Um, oh, I got my kitty. Yeah, he's not sure what to do. Okay, so there's all kinds of information being posted on social media from this CAMS site. So this is, uh, so what you can do is you can change the parameters. So just Google CAMS satellite data methane um, and it brings you to this site and then you can select the base time. Okay, so I just selected today. The area, I pick global. You can zero down on a different, any, any area you want. And, and I'm looking at the total column methane. So it's the amount of methane going all the way up through the, from the surface up to the, up through the atmosphere. And these are the concentrations. So this is the area where the, the, there's more methane in the air column from the surface up to the stratosphere, um, 2320 uh, parts per billion. Uh, parts per bil parts per billion by volume. Okay, so very, very high concentrations there. And you can see that this band where the industry is in the northern hemisphere, the levels are very high, much, much lower in the southern hemisphere and uh, some extending up into the Arctic, but not so much in the high Arctic. So most of the methane is being produced uh, anthropogenically um, and uh, <coughs> from wetlands and uh, things like that, which I'll, I'll get into the breakdown uh, later, okay? So this is the first thing to notice. Now, I selected a whole bunch of, uh, well, let's have a look at some different, um, so this is a total column. Let's look at the surface. Okay, so you can see the surface spots, and this is the um, map that uh, Peter Carter showed that I discussed earlier. So the, you know, there's lots coming from coal mines, either 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 active coal mines or coal mines that are no longer um, in operation. There's lots of leaks from uh, fracking sites that weren't sealed properly and from industrial sites. There's, there's methane coming up from fires from incomplete combustion in other regions. Okay, so you can see the emissions at the surface. And, you know, these are at, so the, the concentrations are reaching 2320 parts per billion at the surface in uh, many different regions on the planet. Okay, now if you look up, uh, if we go up about a kilometer and a half from the surface, you can see that as the methane, you know, comes up from the point sources, it, it is distributed by the atmospheric uh, air patterns, uh, you know, the movement of the air. So this is just, uh, you know, a kilometer and a half up or so. And then we can go up uh, to halfway up through the atmosphere, about five and a half kilometer or so. And you can see the levels are very high about halfway up the atmosphere and they're distributed um you know they're they're they actually move up into the arctic and they cover a lot of the arctic so you can see the distribution has actually changed although the point sources are um at lower latitudes the high the high concentrations do go right up into the arctic and that contributes of course to warming of the arctic although the sun isn't uh, it's in complete darkness at this time of year. If we go up even higher to the height of the jet streams, roughly, the concentrations drop off, as you can see, but you can see that they're still distributed uh, mostly, um, you know, in the, um, you know, reaching right up into the Arctic, some very high concentrations up in the Arctic. And if you go um, to even higher, uh, higher regions, there's not much methane making it up there, but there is, there is some. But this is the purple and blues up here, you know, which is in these levels. The greens here are the sort of 1700 to 1800, and then the yellow's a bit higher, 1820. So as you go higher and higher, the air carries the methane, distributes it around the planet, and you see more of it um, the highest concentrations are actually near the equator. So this is interesting. So let's look at some other regions. So we're looking, we're looking at the Arctic now. Uh, I selected the Arctic and the total column. 
and you can see uh, you know the distribution here uh, at the, where it's more spread out very you know much much lower the lowest points are over the top of Greenland here but there's levels you know generally it's uh, you know about the 1840 1860 throughout the Arctic as you get over the land masses it's the 1900 level and you go over to parts of Northeast Asia and there's levels up to 2320. That's at the surface, okay, in the Arctic. And we're looking at Antarctica now, the total column. And you can see the levels are much, much lower in Antarctica. So over Antarctica, you know, something like 1740, 1760 uh, parts per billion. And the green areas are a little bit higher. Um, Okay, more like, uh, you know, around the 1800 mark. If we look in the Arctic, uh, again, okay, so I showed you this, that this is again the, the total column over the Arctic. And uh, do I go more in the Arctic? No, I go to Eurasia. So let's have a look here in, in, in the Arctic. Um, this is in the sur at the surface. So there's uh, not a lot of, sources, um, the sources are much weaker compared to the industrial sources at lower latitudes is one thing, but there are some point sources, you know, here and here and here near some of the islands and actually right near the North Pole. This is at the surface. And if we go uh, to uh, one and a half kilometers up roughly, the levels go way, way up. Okay, so so the, uh, you know, here we have, air, you know, methane up in these areas, up to 2320 uh, is as high as the scale goes, uh, parts per billion. And then the red is 1900 and higher. So look at the huge difference here uh, between the surface and the, um, the uh, about one and a half kilometers up. Okay, so you can see that, you know, tremendous amounts of methane, but it's not right at the surface, it's spread. So the, it's not sourced uh, from the uh, Arctic per se, but it's sourced at lower latitudes and it's getting up to the Arctic and just hanging there. Um, and then uh, 500 hexapascals, you know, the whole thing is socked in. So halfway up about five and a half kilometers up in, in the atmosphere, you know, this is like 2320, huge concentrations just sitting there, okay? Um, there's very little uh, decomposition of methane. So it's sitting there, its lifetime is long up there, and, uh, you know, come the summer, it causes tremendous uh, warming. And uh, we can go to 300 hexapascal where the jet streams are, and now you see the, you know, a lot more structure in the methane, it's unequally distributed, and this is because this is where the jet streams are, and they're carrying it around. The jet streams are fractured and broken and swirling up in this region, as you know, and they're doing this, they're separating the methane out there. And if we go even higher to 50 hexapascals, you, you're up looking at uh, sort of polar vortex levels where, where the levels of the, um, the levels are, are actually very low inside the vortex. You know, these numbers in the blue and they're higher over here. So the vortex and the very, very cold temperatures, uh, you know, means that there's less methane up there. So this is an interesting uh, distribution that we can see in the Arctic. If we go over Eurasia, you can see, you know, this huge uh, concentration of methane. This is the total column. So this is the highest, so let's have a look. This is also can be seen at the surface. Yeah, so this is at the surface. You can see the sources, the coal mine is just sort of hanging at the surface, 2320 parts per billion. And then as you go up through the column, uh, so this is at 850, so still very intense over the source regions, but it spread, it spread more and halfway up through the atmosphere uh, you know, quite intense uh, levels, but there's some structure um, as we go higher to the jet streams. Of course, you get the um, the jet stream impact in, in breaking up and, and distributing the methane. 
and then go very, very high. And the levels are, you know, you have polar vortex effects coming down and, and things like that. Okay, so that's over Eurasia. And uh, this is just uh, Eurasia at the surface again. And uh, this is uh, halfway up through the atmosphere in Eurasia. And uh, okay, so so this sh that shows us clearly the uh, methane distribution. Um, one thing I did want to check is going back to the, uh, let's go back to the Arctic. Okay. Um, and I want to look at the surface in the Arctic. And now I want to go back here. Uh, and I can't, I, there's no, no data to take me a long way back. So, okay, that's too bad. I wanted to check it, say, in the summer. And uh, I'd have to, to uh, go on and look, look at archived and stored data to do that. But that would be interesting to see, you know, look at the Arctic, look at all the different layers of the atmosphere and look at how the methane point sources are changing and, uh, you know, how the methane distribution changes through the, the air column. Okay, now, of course, climate reanalyzer, well worth having a look at just to check out the temperatures right now. Uh, so t this is a two meter temperature analogy, uh, anomaly. Okay, Arctic is extremely warm, plus three degrees Celsius. Anomaly, Antarctica, plus points, point seven. Okay, but you can see the structure. Right now, where I am in Ottawa, it's very, very cold. Uh, most nights are going down to about minus 26 Celsius with the wind chill down to about minus 35 or so. So we're in this cold spell here because you can obviously, you you uh, you know, this is going to pass. We've had a very, very warm uh, winter up until, um, up until the beginning of this year sort of thing when it's been much, much colder. Anyway, this is why, and you can see the, uh, you know, this heat, this heat here, you know, up in the Arctic region and uh, Antarctica here. But again, this, this huge blob, this huge amount of heat up, uh, up in the Arctic. Okay, so you can try to correlate these temperatures with the distribution, go to the methane maps, compare them where you have this very, very warm temperature, you can look and see whether methane is predominantly coming out of that region in the Arctic, et cetera, et cetera. You know, Earth Null School, also very useful to look at, but it has, uh, part, this is the SO2, for example, in the different regions. Okay. Um, there's North America here. So this is looking over the Arctic. You can see how the, sulfur dioxide is being carried and other uh, pollutants or particulates, et cetera. It's, it's too bad they, they don't put methane on here. Maybe uh, they'll do that soon because that would also be very useful to see. Now, NSEP, the National Centers for uh, the NOAA, National Oceanographic, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the National Centers for Environmental Information section, they have the global forecast system uh, where you can, you know, I just wanna point out these resources where you can get all kinds of information on, um, in this case, uh, you know, temperatures, for example, uh, let's go here. So climate at a glance, you know, global time series, for example, you know, you select all the different parameters that you want and we're looking at the land and ocean temperatures in December, the temperature anomalies, and you can see, you know, how the anomalies are, uh, you know, getting, you know, trending upwards very rapidly. So lots of data there, atmospheric, uh, the CDRs, climate data records, stuff on precipitation, fluxes, uh, everything you want to know about it, you know, any, any climate, climate parameter that you want to see, oceanic uh, information, and uh, sea surface temperature, for example. Okay, so lots of data there, uh, you know, lots of uh, data worth looking at. Okay, so getting back to the methane, um, half of global methane emissions come from the highly variable aquatic ecosystem sources. 
Okay, so so uh, from aquatic ecosystems, they contribute a median of 41% or a mean or average of 53% of total global methane emissions from anthropogenic and natural sources. Okay, keep that in mind because you know when we were when I was showing you these different maps, um, the uh, you know that you can see. You know, it looks like this, the sources by far are all on the land, but according to, according to uh, you know, other data, it's actually, uh, you know, according to this paper, this recent paper from 2021, half of the emissions are from uh, aquatic sources. So that doesn't kind of jive to me with those uh, maps uh, that we typically look at, the CAMS maps, and that has to be looked at in in more in more detail. Okay, so this is an interesting paper. Uh, you know, just um, it's on using UAVs, uh, little drones, to do a to 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 map the methane emissions um, in the Arctic. So they so basically what this paper did, and this was just published like a week ago or something. Uh, you can Google the title if you're interested in the the details, but what they did is they mapped the near surface methane concentrations in a high Arctic fen, so a wetlands with a UAV, okay, with a uh, drone. So they, they basically um, had a tube hanging from the drone uh, just above the ground. This is about half a meter here. They measured the methane here. They could move it up and down. The drone would fly along and uh, there was a pump here, so it drew in the air through this tube, okay, to the analyzer, and it measured the concentration of methane, you know, as this thing flew a grid pattern, you know, and it was only restrained by how long the, the tube was. So, you know, a very interesting way of measuring methane. These are supposed to be the methane molecules here. So not too many of them, and then increasing amounts here. The methane concentrations increased in areas with high flux, so a lot being released from <coughs> the uh, the wetland, and you could measure where you know the, the distribution to a very accurate and fine scale. And uh, you know UAVs can assist in pointing out methane hotspots relevant for biosphere and atmospheric studies. Maps can be used for selecting more representative flux monitoring sites. So often in a in a fen or a bog or a marsh, they'll have a tower and they'll measure methane at different levels, heights above up the tower, but that's fixed. Or they'll have a uh, eddy covariance method, um, uh, you know, in a similar location fixed. But this is a way to get the methane distribution throughout the entire marsh. And there's some interesting data. You know, they talk about all the details here. They they flew this uh, drone through this region. You know, here's, this is the fen basically, and they measured the methane, uh, you know, on diff from day to day in different locations. And then they plotted all of the data here. You know, these sort of things, flight here, uh, different flights and different concentrations measured over the dry tundra and the fen. And you could see how the concentrations of methane, this is, in, uh, this is near surface methane concentration in parts per billion. And you can see the distribution and the variance and get all kinds of neat data on the behavior of the, the fen. So very, very interesting uh, research. Okay, now I just wanna show you the trends of methane in the atmosphere. So I went to Google, Googled greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere. This was Google images. And uh, here, for example, is, uh, you know, methane uh, at different latitudes over time. And you can see the cyclical increase over time. This is uh, 41 degrees south, Cape Brim, and Cape, and 14 degrees south is the greenish curve. Uh, Cape Matatula, and then the blue is 13 degrees north, Ragged Point. If you go up to 45 degrees north, 
41 degrees north, you get these curves. And as you go to 52, 53 degrees north, you get the green curve. So you can see how the levels change with latitude. Um, okay, and uh, this is the uh, World Meteorological Organization. Some information on greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. This is a couple years old, but they this is the most up-to-date that they have. And it's got some interesting plots here. This is the CO2 curve and then the change, the growth rate um, in change in parts per million per year each year. And they this is for methane. So you can see the flattening out from about 2000 to 2007 and then the uptick and it's the rapidly rising rate. Okay, uh, nitrous oxide here as well. Okay, now um, I just want to talk about a few things from the Wikipedia site on atmospheric methane. Okay, um, the okay, so they talk about the global warming potential. Um, they say it's uh, eighty-four, but oh, the twenty-year methane global warming potential is eighty-six. And the 100-year global warming potential is 34. And if you go to a few years, you're talking about 150 to 200, the global warming potential. Okay, so that's, they don't have that quite right. But they talk about uh, methane and methane sources, uh, you know, over time, surface methane, stratospheric methane, um, the, uh, you know, how much warming methane is causing and the emission sources. So this is the estimate of the global methane budget in teragrams of methane per year. And what you can see is this is the base year. Okay, so you can see the amount of methane from wetlands, you know, increasing and the increase over time. So so this is uh, the most recent data in this chart, 181 uh, in 2000 in 2020. This was this paper was published in 2020. So the most fairly recent. Uh, you can see the climb 115 up to 181 over time. Uh, termites, uh, decent sized component, the ocean and hydrates. Okay, um, okay. So those numbers are still fairly low compared to the wetlands, and then the sources, anthropogenic emission sources of methane. So energy production, okay, so this is the fossil fuel industry, quite a bit of methane produced, landfills, ruminants like livestock, uh, waste treatment, um, rice agriculture, those things aggregated to be about double what the energy component is and then bio biomass burning, et cetera. So you can see the breakdown, and then you can see the sinks, how much goes into the soils. Okay, methane is taken up into the soils. It's also, uh, you know, um, tropospheric OH. Okay, so the OH radical reacts with methane, breaks it down, producing CO2 and water. And it also happens in the stratosphere but more about, uh, you know, factor of uh, over 10 times as much um, methane is broken down in the atmosphere, uh, in the in the troposphere, the lower atmosphere, than, than is broken down in the stratosphere. So much, much less gets up to the stratosphere and uh, the imbalances. And then this is an interesting flow chart showing the anthropogenic sources, uh, the fossil fuels, supply chain loss, Okay, so transportation. Um, remember, natural gas is is mostly methane. Over over ninety percent of natural gas is methane. Um, and there's losses in pipelines. There's losses where the where the uh, regulators are attached to your house, et cetera, et cetera. Combustion engine leaks. Coal mining is a big source. Okay, wastewater treatment, livestock, landfills, land conversion, so deforestation for agricultural land. You get the methane, biomass burning, rice um, in fields. And then the natural sources, um, methanogenesis. Okay, so decomposition of, uh, 
of, by bacteria of organic matter uh, in the absence of oxygen produces the, the methane, okay? And, and, and uh, you know, ice trapped, permafrost glaciers, ice caps, plants, wetlands, fresh water, microbes, ocean, the seafloor hydrates, forest fires, etc. So these are all the, so there's many anthropogenic sources which have dominated up to now. The risk is as we get to a much, much warmer planet with uh, a, a uh, much uh, amped up hydrological cycle that the natural sources greatly increase and dwarf our own human emissions. These are the, the sinks in the trop troposphere. So it reacts with the hydroxyl radical, the OH. There's a 9.6 year lifespan roughly of methane in the troposphere because uh, it's broken down. So it's just, this is just the reaction, CH4 plus the OH, excited O8, gives you CH3 plus H2O. And this can further break down into CO2. Okay, but it's also, it's a major source of water vapor. Okay, so in the stratosphere, that water vapor, vapor that is created by the breakdown of methane can often be seen in these, as these noctoluminescent uh, clouds. Stratosphere reacts with hydroxyl radicals, but it's 120 year lifespan, uh, the methane in the stratosphere. So it's broken down quick, quickly in the troposphere within 10 years takes uh, over 10 times longer to break down when it's in the stratosphere. Of course, the, you know, there's chlorine, which also reacts with free, so free atmospheric chlorine, not only does it destroy ozone if it's up in the stratosphere, but the, the chlorine reacts with the methane and break, breaks it down as well. And in the soils, it's the methanotrophic bacteria, which attacks the methane, oxidizes the methane, forming CO2 and water, okay? No anthropogenic sink ex sinks exist. We have to change that, okay? And uh, this is just a plot here illustrating the global methane budget. Um, this is from the Global Carbon Project. So the sources over here, fossil fuel production and use, agriculture and waste, biomass and biofuel burning, um, wetlands and other uh, inland waters, geological oceans, termites, wild animals, permafrost vegetation. These are all the sources, human and and uh, natural, and then the, the sinks here, okay, uh, the total sinks. Okay, so there's lots of good information here, um, more information on the various sources, etc., um, and, uh, yeah, okay, so different trends and so on, and different changes, etc. Lots of good information on this site. Um, now, the Global Monitoring Laboratory, um, you know, has some excellent data on the trends in atmospheric methane. So, September 2021, this is up to date. This is the latest info on their site. So it's, you know, fairly recent. The value of, of the global mean was 1900 parts per billion. And that was, uh, you know, quite a bit higher than the 2020 value. So you can see the, the curve here over the last uh, few years. This is since, uh, you know, go, going back to the early 80s. Okay, with it flattening out and increasing. And this is what I want to bring your eye to. In 2020, the increase, this is the um, and the year, the annual increase. Okay, so the annual increase in 2020 was 15.74 plus or minus 0 0.38 parts per billion. Here we are right here. Okay, so it's cer certainly the highest since the early 80s. The next highest was uh, about 91, 1991 or so. It was 14.05 was the increase. Okay, and uh, 99 or 98 was 12.13. That was a very warm year because of the El Nino. Okay, and this was also a high year here in 2014. 
12.77, but nothing close to this 15.74. Okay, so methane increased more um, here, more here and more in 2020 than it had in any other year. So this is, this is a trend that is very concerning. It's going the wrong way. Of course, the methane global warming potential, I use, you know, I just look, went into Google Images and searched for global methane global warming potential. And, uh, you know, on a 20 year time frame, 86 times and 34 times on a 100 year time scale. So these are the numbers in the latest uh, IPCC report. This is the from the AR5 assessment, the one that uh, the AR6, uh, I don't think those numbers changed. Okay, but you can get lots of other info on the global warming potential. Now, I did a search for the scientific literature with using Google Scholar, atmospheric methane concentration, and I did get some interesting uh, and recent papers. So this is, I want to point out this one here. This one looked for the attribution of the accelerating increase in atmospheric methane during 2010 to 2018. Okay, so what they found out was that the prior estimates of fuel-related emissions reported by individual countries, the UN, was too high for China. So China produces a lot by coal, Russia by oil and gas, but and it was too low for Venezuela from the oil and gas, and the U.S. oil and gas. Okay, from 2010 to 2018, there were increases in anthropogenic methane emissions over South Asia, tropical Africa, and Brazil, coincident with rapidly growing livestock populations in these regions. Okay, uh, peak methane growth rates in 2014 to 2015 are driven, were, were, were not so high because there was, were, sorry, the, the peak methane growth rates, they were high because there were low OH concentrations in 2014 and high fire emissions in 2015. With strong, while strong emissions from the tropical Amazon and tropical Africa and boreal Eurasia wetlands combined with increasing anthropogenic emissions drive high growth rates um, in 2016 to 2018. Okay, so there's lots of factors in play, uh, but they tried to uh, study it and determine, uh, you know, where the emissions were going up, where they were going down, um, and things like that. But, you know, it's very detailed paper. I won't get into the details because what I do want to get on to as I finish up is there in 2021, this paper um, called Atmospheric Methane Removal, a Research Agenda. Now it's open source. So we need to consider carefully how to remove methane from the atmosphere. You know, we talk more about carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere, um, and we need to consider uh, removing methane. Okay, so there were a number of different ideas that were looked at. Okay, but they talk about, you know, they say, I, this is worth reading. So atmospheric methane removal. For example, in situ methane oxidation to CO2 may be needed to offset continued methane release and limit the global warming contribution of the potent greenhouse gas. Because mitigating most anthropogenic emissions of methane is uncertain this century and sudden methane releases from the Arctic or elsewhere cannot be excluded, technologies for methane removal and oxidation may be required. Now they say that CO2 is removal has an increasingly well-established research agenda. I would beg to differ. You know, we need to greatly increase technology, uh, study of technologies to remove CO2 and to remove um, methane. Uh, but there's no framework for methane removal. So they think that there needs to be a research agenda for negative methane emissions, removal or atmospheric methane oxidation. So they propose something called the Methane Removal Model Intercomparison Project, where these are computer simulations to 
look at the different methods. Okay, so, you know, and uh, basically they, uh, so they talk about, you know, how much methane has increased recently, the, uh, how important it is. Like methane is the second most important anthropogenic greenhouse gas after CO2. The radiative forcing is attributable to its direct 0.64 watts per square meter radiative forcing. And if you add the indirect effects, it's 0.97 watts per square meter. That 0.97 is 58% of the 1.68 watts per square meter for CO2. You know, since 1750, the concentration of methane has increased twice as fast as that of CO2. And it's now more than 2.5 times <coughs> pre-industrial levels. And of course, the increase in 2020 was the largest increase in the past four decades. It was actually 15.73 parts per billion, as I explained earlier, uh, not 14.7. Okay, and they talk about the different sources and and so on. And, uh, you know, then like here's the, <clears throat> the methane emissions, anthropogenic methane emissions, the total and that from agriculture and the different trajectories with the different warming scenarios. Um, and uh, so they talk about, you know, so how do we, uh, you know, remove methane and what are some of the technological aspects of it? Well, you need to calculate the energy required to break the bonds and have the actual oxidation of it in the atmosphere. So this is the oxidation, methane plus two oxygen, gives you CO2 plus two water. This is the amount of energy associated with the reaction, but it's difficult to perform at typical conditions of atmospheric temperature and pressure. So you want to find methods to concentrate, you know, take methane out of the air, low concentrations that it is in, concentrate it, and then do your reactions on the, um, methane as it's concentrated and they got they at least they have the number right here in terms of the global warming potential for methane 34 times higher global warming potential than co2 on a 10th century time scale 86 times higher on a 20 year time scale okay so you considerably less methane removal is needed to realize the same climate impact you know, removing methane, you get a big bang for the buck compared to removing CO2. So you could, in principle, restore methane to pre-industrial levels of about 750 ppm by removing about 3.2 of the 5.3 gigatons of methane currently found in the atmosphere. Okay, and uh, these numbers are a lot lower than for CO2, obviously. So, you know, you can calculate the energy to, to remove the methane. Um, and then how do you do it? Okay, so these are some of the methods to extract methane from the atmosphere. Photocatalyst. Okay, so what you use, a catalyst is something that, um, that stimulates a chemical reaction to occur and it's not used up in the process. So, light hitting these substances can break apart the the methane where it can oxidize um can be active or passive so you have a substrate in the air which the light hits acting as a photocatalyst to break apart the methane you can use metals like zeolites or other metal catalysts and the methane you know if you have a large surface area of these things the methane molecules go on it, and these are act as catalysts to break down the methane. Iron salt aerosols is my, um, I think this is the most promising technique, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, it has a lot of other benefits, and I should probably have a whole separate paper on this technique. Uh, Biotrickling filters where you have, uh, you know, think, think of in a farm or something where you have concentrated methane being produced and you trickle the, uh, you know, waste, the uh, a slurry of the manure, for example, and the methane that is created is, is, is taken up um, and it doesn't get into the air in the first place or different soil am amendments, things you could do with the soil 
to uh, remove the, the methane. Okay, so those are different techniques. And uh, so this, uh, the rest of the paper basically goes into some of the details. And of course, the biggest thing is you have to, you would have to pass large volumes of air uh, through the device to realize teragram scale conversion of methane to CO2. Air handling could pass through an initial step of adsorption, concentrating the methane before contact with the catalyst radicals or microbes. Active or passive systems, um, for, you know, and one idea is that you could use a, uh, you could use, for example, uh, you know, these solar updraft chimneys. So large chimneys using, you know, the, the air, the, the air is heated down below and it rises up and, uh, you know, there can be a turbine to generate electricity. And that can then be used, uh, you know, it can be used with photocatalysts activated by sunlight at ambient temperature to remove methane, to break it down. Also, you could use it for N2O and also for halo carbon. So there's lots of interesting uh, technologies and ideas to remove methane. And they, again, they propose this methane removal model intercomparisons project to remove methane. Okay, so... They're, they're saying that we really need to uh, we, we really need to look at this carefully. And uh, this paper here, a nature-based negative emissions technology able to remove atmospheric methane and other greenhouse gases. This is a paper that came out last year and it's all about the iron salt aerosol method. Okay, so it talks about you know, how iron salt aerosols would apply a concentration of iron to the ocean that's two to three orders of magnitude smaller than ocean iron fertilization to enhance marine phytoplankton growth. The iron, the chlorine uh, would would break down methane. And and uh, so, so this uh, iron salt aerosols could block some sunlight to cause a cooling the iron can stimulate phytoplankton growth in the oceans, and the salts, the chlorines, can break down methane. All of these different things uh, you you could uh, ha we could have a climate benefit. So they talk about all of the details and how this process is actually what was going on um, in the past. In previous cooling periods, there was lots of um, basically lots of dust from the deserts um, and much higher concentrations of this dust in the atmosphere. And it did all of these things. Um, so we're talking about using, uh, using this technology to um, basically to uh, mimic natural processes and the dust um, the dust which probably participated in the cooling during the ice ages over the past millions of years. Okay, those are the processes that we're mimicking. Okay, and this is quite different from ocean iron fertilization because the dust is spread over far and over really large, vast areas of the ocean. And, uh, you know, it's not like you're putting iron sulfate into the ocean as in the ocean iron fertilization technique. You're spreading it, it's blowing, it's dust in the wind, basically, which can reduce, break down methane, act uh, the, the chlorine part of it. The iron part can stimulate phytoplankton blooms and it's an aerosol so it can block some sunlight. It can act as cloud condensation nuclei to generate low level clouds and cause cooling or the aerosols themselves can scatter uh, sunlight. Um, so it has all of these potential benefits. And I think this is the most promising technique that we need to develop further. Okay, so anyway, uh, thank you for listening and uh, please consider donating on my PayPal to PayPal on my website, paulbeckwith.net to support my research and videos. So uh, until next time, um, thanks again for watching. Bye for now.